Great, so uh, I think we'll get started. Hello everyone, welcome to today's Middleton Group Masterclass session on electrical safety, what are the odds, part two. For those who don't know us too well, Middleton Group is an Australian owned and operated specialist in electrical engineering organization, working across the power utility, renewable energy, rail, water, and heavy industrial sectors. Our organization has been founded with the sole purpose of working collaboratively with our clients to ensure the successful and sustainable delivery of our projects. We are also firm believers in the knowledge sharing with the wider community, and that's why we're here with you today. Today's session will be presented by David Newton, who is a principal consultant at Middleton Group. Today's presentation will run for approximately 30 minutes with the remaining time open for questions. Before we get started, just some conference, conference room housekeeping before we begin. Can I please ask everyone to keep your microphones on mute unless speaking or have an urgent question? Alternatively, place all your questions in chat and we'll be able to get to them during question time at the end. Thanks, and I'll hand it over to David. Thanks for that, uh, Tanmay. Um, is my screen coming up now? Yep. Good. Okay. Well, good afternoon all, and uh, thanks for joining this session today. I hope you'll all find it uh, useful and you'll get some uh, further learnings on electrical safety uh, when uh, that you can apply in your work. Um, please feed back to us how useful this session's been afterwards using the feedback form or you can email me or Middleton Group Direct. So this is all about what are the odds in electrical safety probabilities. Now, here's a case in uh, Western Australia a couple of years ago when I was working on a project there. Um, you can see that the backhoe has destroyed the conduits. The cables inside weren't uh, even scratched, but they were alive. You can see they would have carried uh, or be capable of carrying quite a bit of current. So you had to ask how lucky was that uh, backhoe operator? So just recapping on last month, we talked about AS60479 and um, shock by direct contact. So 60479 looks at um, the ability of the body to um, withstand certain currents and the probabilities of ventricular fibrillation for different situations. And there were many factors that influenced uh, the situation. Um, but it was a probabilistic approach. And um, it really, the factors were things such as wet or dry conditions, the voltage and the frequency, the body current path. And we even looked at the time of contact with respect to the um, heart cycle. So this month, I want to look at the risks and the probabilities associated with arc flash. Now, many of you would have joined our uh, Quasi Raman's presentations um, on arc flash, which covered incident energy calculations, arc flash labeling, and uh, he presented an illustrative uh, case study just recently. So without going over too much of his ground, I, I will discuss the physics of an arc flash and some of the hazards and the pitfalls to avoid in controlling those risks. First of all, just a couple of definitions uh, that I'll be using and that you'll find in the hierarchy of controls and in many of the um, Australian standards. And the first is de-energized, which means um, the power has been disconnected, but the power is not necessarily isolated. So that is, it, it 
could be reconnected at, uh, at any time. But isolated means it's been um, locked out and tagged out and there's, it's prevented from being unintentionally re-energized. It's interesting to note that um, the hierarchy of controls also mentions hazard isolation, but this is a control measure and it shouldn't be confused with electrical isolation. Hazard isolation is to put something out of reach or put a barrier over it. So electrically isolation, electrical isolation is the best form of control because you've eliminated the hazard altogether. And if we look at the um, uh, ENA standards, the definition of operating electrical work is quite interesting because it says it's switching, in other words, disconnecting the power, proving, so it's testing that you don't have any power there, and then earthing, closing earth switches or applying the earth cables, and then locking out, tagging out, and perhaps erecting barriers and signs. And uh, interestingly, these are also the electrical isolation principles specified in AS4836 that we'll be talking about today too. AS4836 is the Australian standard on safe working on or near low voltage electrical installations and equipment. So just briefly recapping on arc flash, what are some of the features of an arc flash? An arc flash is when current flows in an air gap between conductors, the air ionizes, which means it starts conducting, and the air becomes a plasma, and it liberates a heap of energy. And that energy can be classified as radiant, energy, which is heat and light, right throughout the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves all the way up to x-rays. There'll be a, cl a plasma cloud associated with that arc flash that you'll find later does most of the damage or is considered to be one of the most important and hazardous features of the arc flash. And there's also an arc blast, a pressure blast, Causes of arc flash can be by making and breaking current flow and switching, racking, and often or not, it's um, tools, wires, and conductive items conduct, uh, contacting conductors, usually bus bar in a switchboard. An important feature to note is that arc flash doesn't require any human contact, although um, direct contact with high voltage can lead to arc flash. And I mentioned uh, last month um, a case I'd investigated where uh, the victim had come in contact with an 11 kV overhead cable by carrying a piece of pipe. And it was found that the electricity actually arced over the skin surface, which caused severe external burns um, outside the skin, but the skin didn't actually conduct to cause any heart disturbance. Some important standards to be aware of with arc flash, and these are PPE standards, but they go beyond um, straight PPE to talk about incident energy calculations and uh, other things involved in arc flash. And the earliest one that we would have used in Australia is the American wiring rules, NFPA 70E, which provided uh, several activity tables that defined what grade of PPE you might require for a different activity. But it wasn't terribly useful for, extra, uh, for Australian conditions because of differences in voltage and current levels. 
AS4836, which is the low voltage or safe working in low voltage conditions, has a single table with PPE requirements for different um, low voltage activities versus current levels. Um, again, I, I don't find this the most useful standard to use. There's the IEEE standard 1584 that uh, Cosi would have discussed with you. And that um, is how you would carry out incident, incident energy calculations based on fault levels at switch gear, based on um, protection trip settings, and also on the distance that an operator would be exposed to the, uh, the bare conductors. There's still no specific Australian standard that covers all of Art Flash yet, but uh, that's been worked toward and it's certainly been mentioned in many other Australian standards. So the low voltage wiring rules, high voltage standard, is the low voltage switch gear standard and the high voltage switch gear standard all refer to Art Flash. Probably the most useful document right at the moment is the uh, ENA NENZO 9 2014 version, which has a methodology for determining incident energy, which probably best aligns with the Australian test outcomes. And um, all of these relate to PPE, and you're probably familiar with the uh, PPE requirements for art flash, being footwear, clothing, eye protection, gloves, both, both insulating and um, art protection gloves. There's hearing protection, safety helmet, face shield, hood, and even respiratory um, protection. All of these PPE are often referred to disparagingly um, by operators as the oven mitt. So let's just look at how an arc fault leads to an arc flash. So we can see over here that the spanner has been dropped on the bus bars in the, in the uh, switchboard. The air ionizes at this point, the, the spanner will vaporize and the arc travels away from its source due to motoring action. Um, the arc, when it reaches the end of the bus bar, radiates the full spectrum of electromagnetic waves, including blinding light and heat to a temperature of 20,000 degrees C, which is just unthinkable, but that's hotter than the surface of the sun. The arc then liberates a, uh, a deafening shock wave um, at something like 13 megapascals and a plasma ball is released which is considered to be the largest risk of injury and damage and some of the characteristics of the um, plasma um, it's an extremely high temperature around 5000 degrees C um, it's the ionized gas, which is mainly oxygen and nitrogen from the air, uh, but it's just their nuclei because they've been stripped of all their electrons. So there's a sea of electrons in this uh, cloud and they are highly conductive, magnetic, and important to realize that they're much lighter than air. For those interested in physics, plasma is the fourth state of matter, and it's also the most common state of matter in the universe. So, protecting against dark flash with PPE, the first thing we must realize is that uh, arc flash PPE is not a zero injury standard. The PPE must be worn within the 1.2 cals per square centimetre approach limit. 
because at 1.2 cal per centimeter, that creates the onset of second degree burns. Now, first degree burn is just that top layer of the skin being being um, burnt, which is, I think it's called the epidermis, and that will burn at about one cal per square centimeter, which is the equivalent of holding a cigarette lighter over, or, or maybe one centimeter from your finger for one second. That's the amount of energy there. The idea of PPE is to make the injuries survivable, but it's not going to prevent um, first degree burns. Uh, arc rated PPE is generally rated in four, four gradings, four, eight, 25, 40 cals. 40 cals is, is real oven mitt thick material. One of the main purposes of PPE is to minimize the risk of clothing ignition because often the arc is extinguished once the breaker clears the fault. But uh, once the clothing is ignited, uh, the victim could be on fire for some time. And that's what 80% of uh, electrical burns damage seems to be caused by um, clothing ignition. Arc flash PPE is not necessarily rated for shock protection. So if you were, and similarly shock protection, such as rubber gloves is definitely not rated for arc flash protection. So that if you were working on high voltage equipment, you might need to wear the rubber gloves and then leather over gloves over that. Generally, ENA recommend arc flash rated PPE of four calories per square centimeter. Now I know Quasi looked at this in some detail, but there's just three standards I'd like to go through with regard to uh, incident energy calculations. The first is the old IEEE standard 1584 that we'd used right up until 2018. And that was just based on the radiated incident energy, which is proportional to I squared T over D squared. So I squared T is the instantaneous energy and one over D squared is the inverse square law. The further away you get, um, the energy falls off with the square of that distance. Then a couple of years ago, IEEE 1584 2018 came out, uh, which also considers the direction of that energy flow. Now, in the first case, it's just looking at an equally uh, radiated energy in all directions, just like the sun. But in fact, in a switchboard, uh, the switchboard compartment is going to tend to funnel the energy in one particular direction. As I mentioned before, for Australian conditions, NENS 09, considers the line of fire energy from the plasma cloud in more detail. And this has been put together by a lot of work um, by people like Dr. David Sweeting, Brett Cleves, and many others at the uh, Lang Cove laboratories. So you'll find some interesting formula on incident energy calculations in NENSO 9. And you might even be able to compare those with the 15 84 standards, but the main thing to remember is that with 1584, here's the radiant energy coming out in all directions. So person A at 450 mil and person B at the same distance are both going to receive the same radiated energy. But um, as Nens points out with the plasma cloud, um, 
person A is going to receive about three times more energy than that received by person B. There's several things to be aware of though when uh, doing um, incident energy calculations and um, looking at uh, uh, protection. First of all, there's the risk of the expected fault magnitude and duration not occurring. Um, maybe the um, current might be a bit higher, which will then affect the clearance time. There's also the point of whether it's high voltage or low voltage. High voltage calculations tend to consider a very low impedance arc flash and therefore we use the prospective fault level. And we obviously calculate the, um, the duration based off the circuit breaker or the fuse um, settings. But with low voltage, Menzo 9 says that LV arcing current can be anywhere between 25 to 95% of protective of the prospective fault level. Some of you might remember AS3000 quotes this figure as being 30 to 60% of the fault level. So NEN says, okay, we're going to do our calculations based on AS3000, which stipulates use 30% of the prospective fault level. There's also the risk, especially with low voltage counts, of the arc flash or the arc fault being a high impedance fault and because of the longer clearance time, it could in fact deliver more energy. So you might need to think about that, but if only half the prospective fault current persists for more than four times the rate of trip time, then more incident energy will be received by virtue of the formula I squared T on D squared. Another important point to realize is that arc flash boundaries have no relationship at all to shock protection boundaries. And we'll take a look at an example in the next slide. And low voltage often has a higher incident energy than high voltage. And again, we'll see that here. So this is just for illustrative purposes, I think it's, it's a, um, a cutting I got from a project in Sydney. Um, so don't worry if we can't read the, the figures too clearly, but what I wanted to point out here that an arc flash study has been done on the high voltage terminals of a 22 to 4 15 volt transformer, um, which is rated 750 kVA. And you can see that the fault levels on the high voltage uh, 2,300 amps and on the low voltage 16,800 amps is the fault levels. But the um, arc flash boundary on the high voltage, so that's where the incident energy um, exceeds 1.2 cals per square centimeter is 600 mil here. But you can see on the low voltage terminals it's five meters. Well, that's well and truly outside the transformer enclosure and uh, quite some way off. So you can see that the arc flash boundary is much further away for the LV. But if we considered, say, um, energy safe Victoria's Blue Book on shock boundaries, we'd find that um, for a so-called ordinary supervised person, such as most of us are, or that's what we're considered to be. Um, we've got to stay two meters clear of the high voltage and one and a half meters clear on the low voltage. So I hope that just illustrates the point about 
the fact that there is no relationship between um, those two boundaries. This one's a real cruncher and, and at first it's, it's quite a depressing slide because what it's saying here is if you've got a arc flash suit that's made with a cloth with an arc thermal protective value of eight calories per square centimeters, if the incident energy to the person wearing that happens to be eight cals, the probability of that energy breaking through the suit is 50%. So you've only got a 50% likelihood of not receiving second degree burns, which is the same as saying you, you do have a 50% likelihood of actually receiving the second degree burns. But don't despair because if we have a look, if the incident energy can be backed off a little bit to say seven cals, you can see now we've got a 95% probability of being protected. There's only a 5% probability of breakthrough. So there's a clear message from that, and that is to select the next highest rated suit for your calculated incident energy. No safety talks complete without a discussion on the hierarchy of controls. So I want to relate this specifically to arc flash. And clearly the best control in terms of level of protection and reliability is to eliminate the hazard. Now to eliminate an arc flash hazard requires full electrical isolation. And that requires switching, testing, and earthing. All of these actions require administrative controls, coordination, procedures, training, competency. And so they must be backed up with PPE in order to come back, bring us back to this elimination control. Now, it's good to see that the latest NFPA standard recognizes the importance of some of these other control measures. So substitution, an example might be to reduce the circuit breaker settings while you're working on the equipment to reduce the incident energy levels. Isolation could be just installing a barrier over the bus bars so that if the, the spanner or, sc or screwdriver was dropped, it's not going to cause an arc flash. And there's many interesting engineering controls coming out all the time. You've probably all seen arc detectors and the uh, arc quenching switch gear that um, shorts the three phases down to earth and eliminates the arc immediately. There are other hazards due to arc flash, and these are the hazards caused by the blast, which ENA considers secondary in terms of protecting life. So that clearly we're more interested in the PPE protecting us against the radiated and the plasma cloud energies. But look at some of these other energies. There's an air blast when the uh, air expands to 13 megapascals, which is one kilogram per square centimetre. So over the chest of a, uh, a human or over the torso, that's something like one ton coming down on the chest. Some of the other hazards, noise. So the threshold of pain is 110 dB. So there is a real risk of um, deafness, certainly temporary deafness at least. There's molten metal and shrapnel. So 
not only does the spanner melt, but actually vaporizes, and then the bus bars themselves start to vaporize. Copper uh, melts at less than a thousand degrees C, and we mentioned that the temperature could have been 20,000 degrees C. There's blast lung injury. If uh, the victim takes, takes a breath of that to superheated air, And of course, toxic smoke from PVC giving off fumes. And so if I just jump back, all of these items are considered secondary. And in part, it may be because the blast tends to push the victim away from the danger. But it is important to bear in mind these other risks associated with arc flash. So in summary, um, when we're designing for electrical safety, we need to bear in mind the shock hazards, both by direct contact and indirect contact. And remember that the safe shock boundaries are determined by the voltage. And we also need to bear in mind arc fault hazards, where radiant heat is proportional to the energy divided by the square of distance. The plasma cloud, the direction in which the plasma cloud is likely to move which is considered the major hazard. One really important point to note on direction is I mentioned that the plasma cloud is much lighter than air by virtue of all the atoms being stripped of their electrons. That means there's a much greater risk to people working on top of a switchboard or above a switchboard. And then the other arc fault hazard is the blast. And the arc blast is considered more in relation to power rather than energy. And the safe barriers for incident energy are just any incident energy less than 1.2 cows per square centimeter. I'm onto the last slide here now. And that is the eternal triangle. And to me, this one's a little bit like um, a switchboard with two incomers and a bus tie, uh, which is Castell keyed. So you, you have two keys, but you've got three circuit breakers, but you can only choose two at a time. And uh, Whilst, whilst there is a humorous side of this slide, what is being overlooked here is safety, which has to encompass time, quality, and cost. So on that note, I'll wind up. I want to thank you all for logging in today and for showing your interest in electrical safety. I should acknowledge uh, the opportunity that Middleton Group have provided me to present this session today. And we hope that your learnings will help you to prevent an accident. Now, next month, I'd like to uh, finish off this safety presentation by discussing risks and probabilities of shock by indirect contact. So these are, um, Incidents such as earth potential rise, lightning, and pipeline-induced voltage. So as we did last month, I'm happy to attempt to answer your questions. And I'd also like you to feed back um, how you could use this information in your work. So thank you for that. And back to you, Tanmay. Great. Thank you for that excellent presentation, David. So uh, now is the time for any questions that anyone
may have had. I'll just uh, check the chat. So we have a question from Simran. Uh, what is the prospective fault level? Uh, okay, the, the prospective fault level is the most of amount of fault current that a system can deliver to your plant. So it's usually determined by the supply authority or the transformer upstream. So it'll be the voltage upstream and it'll be the upstream impedance that limits that fault current, but it's going to be in thousands of amps. Great, I see we have a hands up. Yeah, um, yeah, hi, hi David. Uh, th hi. Thanks a lot for, for the nice presentation. Just, just wanted to uh, check uh, whether uh, I, IEC compliance uh, switch gears are recommended or not because uh, in the last couple of years, I have been specifying uh, IEC compliant, R plus uh, compliant uh, switch gears where R R plus related issues are taken care into the design of the switch gear itself. Okay, sorry, Damesh, I, I didn't really pick up. Were you saying the IEC compliance, were you? Yeah, there is an IEC standard which says uh, I, IEC compliant, R plus classification compliant, thereby the internal R plus the switch gear is designed such that internal arc plus between the bus bus is not directed towards the operators. Okay. There, but the design itself, and there is IEC code, I don't remember the IEC exact code, but uh, there is IEC, IEC that requires this to be taken care into the design of the switch gear itself. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not particularly familiar with the IEC codes. Um, oh, okay. I, I did refer to the Australian codes, which were um, the high voltage and low voltage uh, switch switchboard codes that do refer to Arc Flash. So I, I'm sorry, I really can't help out much uh, in relation to IEC. I, I know I only refer to IEEE and um, NFPA. Yeah, okay, thanks. I, I just wanted to highlight that there is there is such thing that uh, some of the things of the R plus related things can be taken care into the design of the SP as well as the allegation switch board. It's a good point. That that certainly can be. And companies yeah. such as AVB and Siemens will um, will certainly stress all, all the features they've taken care of R Flash within their switchboards. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Damish. Yeah, okay, thank you. We've got one from Lionel Orford who said it may be worth mentioning that low voltage usually carries a much higher arc flash risk and that's very true, Lionel. And uh, I think in that example on the transformer I gave um, where the, the prospective fault level on the uh, low voltage side was something like nine times the high voltage side that relates directly to incident energy. So that's a good point. Thank you. Did we have any other questions? I think we've got a question in chat. Um, how does a high impedance to ground system affect arc faults? Okay, that, that's an interesting one. Clearly, if, if the arc 
fault occurred across two phases, it's not going to make any difference at all. But if the arc fault occurred between one phase and um, uh, one one phase and the ground with a high impedance fault, uh, there's still a strong chance that the arc will develop. Um, but if it's low voltage, there's also a good chance that that arc will be dancing around and it may jump across to another phase. Or if it didn't, it might even extinguish itself and then re-strike. And so this could happen several times. So uh, a high impedance fault, as I said earlier, doesn't guarantee reduced uh, incident energies because the time that it exists for could be much longer. Lionel's question on um, 61439, no, I don't, I don't think it does refer to um, anything on arc flash because um, that standard is about the effects of current on human beings and, and livestock for that matter. Yeah. Great. Did we have anything else? Last call for questions. All right, um, well, okay, one more question. I presume optical arc fault detectors would see the dancing on the faults? Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. In, in fact, in the early days, um, maybe some 20 or 30 years ago, uh, the damn things were so sensitive they would even see uh, a fluorescent light striking up and sometimes they would take out your substation when you switched on the of fluorescent lights. Uh, other times somebody would take a photo with a camera and it would trigger them off. So the arc flash detectors now are more finely tuned for the frequencies um, of, of the flash and I guess they're also um, stored away inside the switchboard and won't be susceptible to external ones but they would they would certainly see the, the fault inside the board dancing around between phases and phase back to earth. Yeah. The literature on the dancing faults. Well, I, I, well, I, I did, I did give a couple of acknowledgements at the end of my um, talk there, but um, I don't think they talk about the the dancing of faults. So all that means is that the arc is jumping across the phases, and then it might jump over to Earth. In fact, from my readings, generally the arc even if it is initially across two or three phases, will eventually jump across to Earth. I mean, it's, it's as that plasma cloud expands, it's conductive, or it, it's going to take you to Earth as well. So the, the more current it can carry, the quicker that the protection device upstream will clear the fault. Uh, a convergence to any Australian approach to performing arts flash hazard studies. Well, yeah, I, I, I think now that the NENS 09 is, uh, is a very good approach, although um, IEEE 1584 is fine as long as you use the um, 2018 standard. 
I understood that NINS was originally, or at least the 09, uh, the guidelines there, which incidentally is called guidelines for PPE, but obviously in determining what PPE you need to wear, you need to make calculations on incident energy. Um, so that NINS was, I think, originally, or, or at least a committee was formed with a view to preparing an Australian standard, but it, uh, it didn't go all the way. And so ENA picked it up and, um, and developed that standard. So I'd, I'd strongly recommend you um, review NENS 09, 2014. How, if somebody's asked how to contain or prevent an arc flash in the hazardous classification area. Good Lord, that's got to be uh, Lee Wee Tong. Thanks for that, <laughs> William. Um, I, I, I would never. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I wouldn't install any electrical equipment in a, in a zone one area, certainly not a switchboard with arc flash, although I guess it happens and the switchboard might be pressurized or there might be some way of um, preventing the hazardous gas from getting into the switchboard. But uh, if, might I, be vacuum. if I was, a, uh, what was that? <laughs> it might be vacuum, the switchboard is vacuum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Instead of GIS, the whole switchboard could be vacuum. But, but it is, a, it's, it's an important point to note though, that arcs can occur in hazardous areas and therefore there's going to be an explosion by hook or by crook and mm. all the calculations on incident energy in the world will not take into account the energy of the gas or the hazardous dust. So thanks for that, uh, Rui Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the latest release of NINS 09 is 2014. I think we also had a question a bit further up. How much does the switchboard IP rating affect the fault rating and the arc flash of a switchboard? Okay, and, and that's a good question, Roshti. And uh, yeah, welcome back to Australia. It's, it's got, I think you're in Brisbane now, aren't you? Um, yeah, the, the switchboard IP rating is not as important as the switchboard fault containment rating. So if you purchase a switchboard that's got a fault containment rating of 50 kA for one second, as long as that switchboard is fully buttoned up, every door is on it, every door has been closed and locked, and it's been well maintained and is still in the same state, as its type tested board, in other words, it hasn't had modifications done to it, then it would be able to contain the 50 kA for one second without causing an arc flash, a dangerous arc flash out of that switchboard. Does that clear up that question, Roski, or do you want to? Pursue that. Yeah, hi David. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an incident that uh, uh, we had uh, in the past where uh, the switchboard manufacturer was uh, uh, had had the type test certificate basically from uh, uh, on a board that was IP forty one or forty two. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, but yeah, the but the uh, the required fault rating was I uh, was sixty five kA for one second uh, wow. on that. So we were uh, we were we were questioning whether that what we want we the required switchboard on the site was IP fifty four uh, being a sewage treatment plant, and uh, the question came over that okay does this type of certificate still is still valid on this switchboard? So or or should we have done the original type testing on an IP 54 
at the required fault rate to IP uh, 60, 65 KA for one second. Right, okay. I'd, I'd, I'd just repeat, the IP rating is very different to the fault rating and there's, there's not really a relationship. IP is just about the ability of solid objects and dust or yeah. water from getting into an enclosure may not be a switchboard either. Whereas the fault rating on the switchboard is the ability to contain the fault. So uh, a 63 KA one second switchboard may only be IP say 42 or something, but it'll, it, it's been designed to contain that fault. So the, if you're looking for a switchboard fault rating, you've got to go to the manufacturer and see how, how well he's built the board in terms of containing that pressure wave, not keeping water out or keeping dust out. Yeah. One question. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, some of uh, in some of the uh, substation uh, installation, I came across like switch gear. They have uh, delegated like duct that's installed from the switch gear all the way to the wall. So in, in event of fault, that is to release the pressurized gas. Uh -huh. out from the switch room. Does it have to reduce the I mean up fresh or um no in in fact many switchboards mm. have a, a venting duct on, yeah venting duct correct yeah just on the top they don't they don't even necessarily have to dispel the uh, the outflash energy outside the building as long as it's not being vented straight at um people themselves who are standing there. Yeah. So it, it can be vented upwards. Often uh, switch gear vents the arc flash downwards. Uh, it probably makes quite a bit of damage to the cables, but it'll discharge down into the cable pit underneath. You'll see so so. I'd just be a bit cautious about having a duct that led out of the building that it's going to be capable of withstanding that shock wave, uh, you know, the 13 megapascals of shock. I mean, that, that, that wave has been not known to knock over brick walls. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for coming to uh, David's talk. And thank you, David, for your excellent presentation. I think we'll be ending it there. Again, thanks everybody for coming.